Hey, welcome to the Centre Podcast. We're a church based in Dural, Sydney, who love Jesus and so want to make him the centre of our lives, community and world. We pray that you're blessed by this word and that it reveals God's love for you in a new way. G'day guys, how's it going? Murray here. We're uh, continuing to go through our Sermon on the Mount series and today uh, we are looking at a really challenging virtue, which is humility. Hmm, (laughs) humility, I hear you say. It's a bit of a tricky virtue in 2024. It's not one which is necessarily rewarded. Uh, And I think, to be honest, it's one where you can often disqualify yourself for being a bit too humble. You can miss out on opportunities at work. In fact, you could miss out an entire job for being too humble. Um, Really, if you want to get a job these days, you've got to get a CV, which really is a document which really amps you up and tells everyone how great you are, how proficient and experienced you are at different skills and different types of jobs. Um, And yeah, I mean, I'm kind of thinking about writing a CV right now. Hypothetically, you'd even in your weaknesses section (laughs) sort of often not be humble even there. Your biggest weaknesses in your CV might be, you know, I just care too much or I struggle saying no or I'm a real perfectionist. This is the type of humble bragging. I think this is now a term that is in our lexicon, a humble brag. Even a humility can end up being a brag in 2024. And I think that really humility can look a little bit different today um, than it did back in Jesus' time. But really, as we look at this passage of Scripture today, humility is at the core of it. So let me read our passage for us today. It comes from Matthew 6, 1 to 18. And Jesus in this passage is talking about three different spiritual practices. And the first one is giving to the needy. So he says to the people as he preaches, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Because if you do so, you'll have no reward from your father in heaven. And he says, so when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Then he starts talking about prayer. He says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, And pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans. If they think they'll be heard because of their many words, do not be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. And he says, this then is how you should pray. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And finally, he speaks about fasting. He says, when you fast, do not be somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. There's a few things that point out to me in this passage. But the first thing is the word hypocrites, which he uses three times, each time when introducing his thoughts on each of the three spiritual practices. He says, so when you give to the needy, 
Do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do. He says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites who love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners. And he says, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. Hypocrite. We have a strong word, isn't it? <laughs> and yet the hypocrisy and the word hypocrite that we understand today is a little bit different to the meaning that Jesus had when he said hypocrite back in his day. When I think of a hypocrite, it is someone whose words are misaligned to their actions, that they say one thing and they do another. But the word hypocrite in Jesus's time was specifically about somebody who was a theatre actor. This was what theatre actors, people who performed in plays, were referred to in first century Jerusalem and the Roman Empire. They were referred to as a hypocrite, not as a term of negativity or a slander, but that was just their name in the same way that you're an actor today. You were a hypocrite in first century Jerusalem. And this idea then from our modern understanding of just our words and deeds being misaligned goes a little bit deeper because Jesus is saying a hypocrite is someone who goes up on stage, wears a mask in that day and age, and pretends to be somebody else for the applause and acclaim of others. See, what he's actually saying is a hypocrite for him is someone whose words and actions aren't aligned to their heart, to their true selves. And once again, as Jesus has continued to be critiquing in the Sermon on the Mount, he's not as concerned about our words and our deeds as he is first and foremost our heart, our inner intentions. So Jesus is saying when we engage in spiritual practice, don't do it for the applause of the audience. Don't do it for a $10 rose wrapped in cellophane that is beautiful today, but will go brown and moldy and end up in the green bin tomorrow. But rather, do it for an audience of one, for your heavenly Father, who sees all things at all times in all places, because his love is your true, deep, everlasting reward, a tree of life that bears its fruit in and out of season and is everlasting and eternal. Not a $10 rose, which is going to waste away. I love this quote by Dallas Willard in his book, The Divine Conspiracy. He says, when we perform for the applause of others, the ego is bloated and the soul shrivels. I love that. When we perform for the applause of others, the ego is bloated and the soul shrivels shrivels. But see, on face value, what Jesus is saying here is actually a little bit confusing because earlier in this same sermon in Matthew 5, 16, he says, let your light shine before others. And yet now he's saying, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others. So which is it? Is it let your light shine before others? Let your good deeds, your character, your words of encouragement and love shine before others like a city on a hill, as he said previously? Or is it be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others? Which one is it, Jesus? Is it be a light shining on a hill? Or is it be careful and do your spiritual practices in secret? Which one? Well, it's yes, <laughs> it's both. Because the whole passage in Matthew 5.16 is let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So, with that in mind, he says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Because if you do so, you will have no reward from your heavenly Father. See, to steal some language from N.T. Wright, Jesus is saying, your good deeds are like signposts, things which are pointing people who are now still living on earth to a kingdom of heaven. And if those signposts are pointing people towards God, <laughs> then they are light and they are good and they are righteous and they are doing their job. But 
if these signposts get turned around and are just pointing people towards how good we are, then they're actually distorted. (laughs) They're bastardized. They're ruined. We need to be really careful when we're engaging in our religious practices, our spiritual practices, that we are pointing people when they see those good deeds towards God and not towards ourselves. We need to be humble. We need humility in this. But Jesus is actually giving us something so much more here. He's offering us freedom. Freedom from what? Well, from what others think. I mean... Isn't that what we all want? (laughs) A freedom from worrying about what others think? Because I think we can so often within either Christian circles or our work circles or our family or friend circles be obliged to do things for sometimes the admiration of others or sometimes to avoid criticism from others. I better do that thing or people won't think I'm a good person or a good son or a good mum or a good Christian. But Jesus is trying to offer us freedom from the worries and concerns of what others think. I'm just going to speak from personal experience. I am the worst version of a parent, (laughs) of a father, when I'm caring about what other people think about me in the line at the shops or at the park or at the beach. And likewise, I'm the worst version of a Christian when I'm caring about what other people think. And this is kind of what Jesus is saying in this wider Sermon on the Mount. He says, you're actually blessed when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. He says, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecute the prophets who are before you. And very soon, in just a few years time, we'll also persecute Jesus for his acts of righteousness. And now he says, your father sees what is done in secret and will reward you. So he says, don't be like the hypocrites, those people trapped in the facade of social status. But instead, when you give to the needy, he says in Matthew 6, 3, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. What is Jesus saying here? Is he just telling us to be financially irresponsible and not track our money? No. I believe that God wants us to be good stewards of everything that we are entrusted with. I think that God wants us to be strategic and intentional with the money that we have so that we can naturally and organically (laughs) have an outpouring of generosity so that we don't have to be calculated when it comes to our charity, that it's a natural outflowing. I sort of think of When I'm driving a car, I'm not thinking about what my left and my right hand is doing. I'm just thinking about getting to the destination. And likewise, Jesus says, when you give to the needy, do not be worried about the intricacies of what your hands are doing, what is coming and going in that generous state. But just focus on the destination, the kingdom of heaven which you can bring one inch closer to earth through your generosity and charity. Next, Jesus addresses prayer. And he says, when you pray, this is Matthew 6, 6, go into your room, close the door and pray for your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. But then (laughs) three verses later, He says, this then is how you should pray. And he says the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So, hold on, which (laughs) one is it? Is it when you pray, go into your room and close the door and do it in secret? Or... Is it 
do as Jesus did and lead a communal prayer in front of a large group of people on the top of a hill. (laughs) Which one is it, Jesus? Is it pray in secret or pray in a communal state where you lead people (laughs) in it? And once again, it's both. Because the Lord's Prayer is actually by its very grammar, deeply communal. It's not just about us. It's our Father in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. It's a prayer of humility, a communal prayer of humility. It's not just about me, not just about you. It's about us. Craig Keener says the Lord's Prayer is not the type of prayer of the complacent and the self-satisfied, but a prayer of the humble, the lowly, the broken, the desperate, the meek, who will inherit the earth, as Christ has said earlier in this Sermon on the Mount. And I I need to hear that. <laughs> Because I I sometimes really struggle with prayer. And the reality is, I think we all can. See, I, I kind of think of prayer for me as going to the beach. Sometimes I go to the beach because it is a 40 degree day. And I get out past where the waves are breaking and I am floating in this cool, soothing salt water and the sun is kissing my face and I'm floating, weightless, allowing the strength and mass of the ocean to hold me and there is no place I would rather be. And sometimes I go to the beach (laughs) and the sun is bearing down on my shoulders and I can feel my shoulders starting to burn. So I need to apply my my, my third application of SPF 30 plus sunscreen that's glooping and sticky and oily and there's sand getting caught in my book and the small sunshade tent that I've put up for my family is starting to fall over from the wind and I'm feeling insecure in my masculinity and I don't want to be at the beach. In fact, the beach is the last place that I want to be right now because I'm getting nothing out of it. It is a chore. But even when I'm finding the beach difficult, I I swim in the strength of the waves and and my body gets that little bit stronger. And I, I lay in the sun and my skin gets a little bit more golden. And, and I build one more sandcastle with my family and I, I grow in relationship just a little bit deeper with the people I love most. And sometimes prayer is the same way. It isn't about the immediate satisfaction. It's about the slow incremental formation. Because God doesn't always answer our prayers. Prayer is an Amazon. <laughs> Sometimes prayer is about making my life more like heaven. But prayer is always about making me more like Jesus. And as we pray, we're invited into our Father's arms and we are required to take on a posture of humility, independence, a heart orientated back to God, to a true state of flourishing. Because Jesus doesn't just encourage or even request (laughs) that we engage in these spiritual practices. He actually assumes (laughs) we're already doing them. In fact, three times, each time when he introduces these three spiritual practices, he says, so when you give to the needy and when you pray and when you fast, there's an assumption that this is just a given 
that we are engaging in it. So my question to you is simply, when? When do you give to the needy? When do you pray? When do you fast? And you're probably there thinking, if you're anything like me, yep, give to the needy, check. Prayer, yep, check. Uh, Fasting. Mm. (laughs) If you're anything like me, it maybe has been a couple of minutes (laughs) since the last time you fasted. But Jesus assumes that we're engaging in it. So if Jesus assumes it, I want to give us just a few quick thoughts on fasting. Number one, Jesus not only assumes that we're doing it, but he did it himself. And I I think with all this association and negative thoughts of asceticism and monasticism and work-based faith, which orbits around fasting, we need to recognize that Jesus did it. (laughs) I think that's really important. Sure, Jesus turned water into wine and fed around 20,000 people that we know of through his miracles. But he started his ministry by fasting in the wilderness. Secondly, fasting is about denying the flesh, not about dragging up old skeletons. Um, So my thought is, if you have a history of disordered eating, or maybe even just you're aware that your relationship with food isn't the healthiest, I'd maybe suggest that you fast from something other than food. It could be TV, it could be social media, it could be shopping, but the point is to deny the flesh, not to drag up old skeletons. Don't open up old wounds by engaging in fasting. Jesus wants you to be free from those things, not diving back into them. Third thought, fast for faith, not for fitness. And this kind of ties into the previous point. Are you fasting for fitness or faith? Because you can't actually do both at the same time. And you can do both, just not at the same time. With a culture now where intermittent fasting is increasingly popular, you go ahead and do that. (laughs) There are a bunch of health benefits which have been shown to relate to fasting. And if you want to do it for your fitness, great. If that works for you, fantastic. But you can't fast for your fitness and your faith at the same time. You need to be intentional. As Jesus says, it's about your heart posture. Are you fasting right now? And you need to be honest with yourself to shrink your waistline, or to grow in your faith. Because ultimately your Father in heaven sees all things. So if you are already intermittently fasting for fitness and you still want to deny the flesh, maybe cut out caffeine. It's zero calories. (laughs) But it's sure going to hurt to go without if you drink as much coffee as I do. (laughs) Or maybe you want to fast from sex for a time, as Paul says. Do not do it for an extended period of time from a spouse, but maybe that is a way that you choose to, as a couple, agree upon denying your flesh to fast from physical intimacy. And that kind of feeds into my final thought on fasting, that Ultimately, it's for intimacy with God. Remember, we're doing all of these spiritual practices to grow in deeper intimacy with our Heavenly Father. Because this is what Jesus tells Satan in the wilderness in Matthew 4.4. He has been fasting and Satan says, hey, you're the son of God. See those stones over there? Turn those stones into bread. And Jesus replies, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on the very word that comes from the mouth of God. See, Jesus is pointing to the fact that when we fast, it creates a situation in which we are relying on God for strength. And when Paul writes, when we are weak, he is strong. When we fast, we deny ourselves for the sake of God, but we also deny ourselves to rely on God. It declares more of Christ and less 
of me. And look, ultimately, all of these things need to be a personal choice between you and God. This is not for me to dictate what spiritual practice you're going to step into this week. But that is the question that I want to leave you with today. Not if, but when are you going to engage in spiritual practices, in spiritual formation more deeply? As I've been speaking today, have you been called, actually, I could be a bit more generous with my finances to different charities, to different people who are in need. Maybe you've been thinking, hey, actually, I'm feeling really convicted. I need to think about how I can be going deeper in prayer, be more regular in my prayer life. Or have you thought today, actually, it's been a real long time since I've engaged in a fast. Maybe that is the spiritual practice that I'm going to engage in this week. But I'd like to continue to encourage you. (laughs) It is not for the glory of man, but is for the glory of God. Thanks so much for joining us. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to help others discover this channel. Check out the description if you want to find out more or get in touch with us at the Centre Dural. But in the meantime, praying for God's hand over you as you continue to step into everything Jesus has in store for your life. Be blessed.